What a privilege to be in front of you and what a tough, tough spot I am in right now. Um, but I think the Lord wants to speak to us and I hope that you receive the word the way it is meant to be. It is not meant to be a condemnation on us, but it is intended to be an invitation for us to become the church that he wants us to become, to become the parents he wants us to become, to become the kind of Christians that can actually turn the world upside down. And so uh, let's pray. I, I, I need your prayer today. I, I really do. I, I need the spirit to guide me. I need to just hand this over to the Lord because if not, I'm going to mess it up. And uh, if you don't believe I can, that can happen, try not praying for me right now. And you'll see the, how quickly that comes to pass. So please, if you could stand with me one more time and just extend your hands toward me. And let's go to the throne of grace right now in Jesus' name. Father, we come to you one more time to ask for your blessing, to ask that you speak to us. We want the voice of God and not the voice of a man. We want the Spirit speaking to his bride. We want the Father admonishing his children. We want to hear your voice, O oh God, today. And please help me step aside and allow you to speak to our hearts, to minister to us, to to visit with us today, to visit with our visitors, to visit with those who are around the world longing for a voice, longing for a word from God. And I know you have that for us. Please help us today in Jesus' name. Everyone says in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Thank you kindly. We are going back to Deuteronomy 6 for today, as if you didn't already know that. It's uh, known as the Shema. And those that know it, please repeat it with me. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohenu Adonai Ehad. Now, now let's do that again, but repeat it with me as, as though you mean it, all right? It means here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, so uh, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Ehad. You have it on the screen, and you have the Hebrew up top, and then you're going to have a transliteration the way it would be pronounced in English, and then, of course, you have the translation. So now that you have that, let's do that one more time, all right? Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. The last time I was privileged to bring the word to you, I taught you the meaning of the word Echad. It means one. One. Our God is one. Guess what? He is still one. This is the foundation of Christian theology. It certainly was the foundation of Judaism for many centuries before. When Jesus was asked what the first commandment of all was, he said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This has to be ingrained within us. This has to become a part of us. Everything that we are in this world and the next flows out of the Shema. Now, Shema is the first word in this whole passage, but the actual passage doesn't end in verse 4. It goes all the way through verse 9. And so... Jewish people, when they talk about that passage, that important passage, they just call it the Shema. Shema. And Shema means to hear. It means to listen. It means to pay attention, to take heed, and even to obey. It's a very rich word, and I think it defines much of what God has given me as a ministry, and I think it should define much of what each of us are in this world to the glory 
of God. It's part of our kingdom calling to be witnesses to the one God. In fact, I don't have time to show you right now, but within the Shema, the word witness appears in the Hebrew in a powerful, powerful way. We are called to be witnesses of the one God. We are called to portray or show off this God to the world around us. Um, in the time when Jesus and the apostles were on in the world, that calling involved the fact that they were going to show off the true God in the midst of a society that had many gods. Romans and Greeks had pantheons of gods of all kinds and all sizes. You may even see, you may even say all flavors. If you like to drink a little bit, you had a god for that. If you uh, were into sex, you had a goddess for that. It, whatever, whatever your human desires were, there was a god for that. And in the midst of that society, there comes a group of people uh, composed of 12 tribes and repeating daily, at least twice a day, this scripture. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, one, one. Can you imagine what that meant to the people around them? It was offensive. What do you mean my God is not real? What do you mean my God doesn't exist? What do you mean only the God of Israel is the true God? And while we don't live in that, well, well, at least within our society, we think we don't live in a pagan world with many gods. However, those gods are still present with us. They have just changed names or their outward appearance. We are still living in a society that has a God of sex and a God of vices and alcohol and drug addiction and whatever else you want to say. And so the calling remains the same. We are to be witnesses of this one God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other ideology but me. No philosophy but me. No psychology but the one I have given you in my word. Shema is still a word we need to hearken and listen and pay attention and take heed and obey. It's still a reality. And so our Bible Institute, you know this, uh, we, we stress this and our students have to memorize this. Why? Because it is our identity. And we like it in the Hebrew. Why? Because that's how God revealed it originally. But it's, it's beautiful when our children know this. I, uh, my family, since we came into the truth, and I know that expression may be offensive to some people today. And I don't mean to be offensive. But this is the truth. This is still the truth. That doesn't make us better than other people. I am, I am not saying that we should embrace this identity of being one God people. Just to kind of lord it over other people. To, to look at, uh, to people over our shoulder. Or to think we are better than they are. Please don't, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I do believe we have the truth. Uh, but but we, when, we, when we represent God. We have to represent the God of the Bible. Who is love. And so, yes, I will tell you, we love you. No matter what belief you come from or what sort of life you have lived, uh, we have all been there. We have all been sinners. So the fact that we have the truth doesn't mean we're better people than others. It means God's grace has been poured upon us for a purpose, for a reason. It comes by grace through faith. And I understand it. But it still means that we have a calling to be witnesses to the Shema. So when we came into this truth, um, we, our family has this tradition that whenever they hand us our babies, we, you know, the minute the nurse gives it to us in our hand, you know, the first thing that they hear is, 
Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Those are the first things that we want them to hear as soon as they are born. And in Jewish tradition, they, they want the Shema to be the last words they ever utter when they are leaving this world. So it should be the first thing we hear. It should be the last thing we say when we are going to the one who loved us. And it's beautiful when our children, and I have seen uh, the children of our FTBI uh, students and staff, uh, when they post a video on Instagram or, or wherever, and their children are, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, uh, we had some kind of event, and, and they said, that any child that wants to say a verse of scripture, and Elijah Enriquez went all the way to the front with boldness, grabbed that microphone, and guess what he said? Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. I think Sister Aleha was saying, I didn't know he knew that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I knew he knew that because Cakes has been a student of our institute for a long time. And see, what you learn, you pass on to your children. How is that for an advertisement for the Bible Institute here? <laughs> Hallelujah. You should be in the Bible Institute. But, okay, now, now the Bible tells us, okay, this is the first thing. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But it, then there's stuff that flows out of that. All right? And, and you shall love the Lord your God, is the next verse, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. See, it's the same commandment. It's not two different commandments. If there is one God, you have to love that God with all, with everything, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And from this is, 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 is the fact that Jewish people want to say the Shema right before they live. Because one of the greatest rabbis of history, Rabbi Akiva, uh, they say that he uttered the Shema as he was being executed by the Romans in the aftermath of the rebel, revolt against Rome in the second century. When the Jewish people rebelled against Rome and, and they lost the war. Rabbi Akiva began to repeat the Shema. They were tearing his flesh with iron combs. But he was accepting upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jewish people call the Shema. To accept the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. He was reciting the Shema. And the disciples that were around looking at his, at his torture and his martyrdom. He said, oh Rabbi, so much. Must one go so far in suffering for the sake of Torah, for the sake of our God? And this is what he said. He said, all my life I had been troubled by this verse. Because I knew how to love my God with all my strength. And I knew how to do this with all of my heart. But I finally now get a chance to love the Lord my God with all of my soul. Because now I have, I have a chance to give my life for the sake of the Shema. And so he took the opportunity to fulfill that. And as he was dying, he recited the Shema. And tradition says that he prolonged his articulation of the last word, which means one. Because he wanted that to be the last word he ever uttered on earth. This commandment has been such a force in identifying Jewish people around the world through history. That when a crisis arises... When a Jew's faith is tested, when they are persecuted, when, when there is anti-Semitism, this is what they call it, the hidden love of the Shema is awakened in the soul of, of Jews that throughout their life were just secular Jews of even, or even atheists. 
People that maybe denied God or never lived for God. One day in their lives, whenever there is persecution, there is something within their souls. And history has taught us that even the most obtuse, insensitive, and indifferent Jew is ready to submit to martyrdom for the sake of the Shema. I read a report where uh, an atheist Jew, as he was about to be killed by the Communist Party, he was an atheist. But as he was about to be shot, because he was a Jew, he stood up in front of the people that were about to shoot him. And he said, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. This should be a part of our hearts. This should be deeply ingrained in our hearts souls and the commandment continues and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way when you lie down when you rise up you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates now where it says they shall be upon your heart that's how it should actually read because it doesn't say in your heart, which is what we usually read. And, and we think, yeah, you know, the word of God should be in our hearts. But, but the Hebrew says, al levavecha, upon your heart. Upon your heart. Now, people have asked, so why, why doesn't it just say in your heart? Because that's where we want the word of God, right? That's where we want the Shema. And the Jewish scholars answered and said, no, no, you have to continue pouring the word upon your heart. You do it so continually. And that's why the whole verse is like, you, you will teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. They say, that's how we pour the word of God upon our hearts. Those of you that like barbecue probably would understand that. Right? Those of you that know how to cook the meat to where every bite is just the perfect, flavorful, melting in your mouth can of meat. And as I'm enjoying that, I usually, how did you manage to do this? Oh, brother, you know, you get some spices together. And then, and then, and then it's like, and you put the meat in there, and then, and then you leave it overnight, and it's it marinates. The meat starts to absorb the flavor of the spices, and even as they're cooking it, they're they're still, you know, like they have the little brush and they put it upon the meat as it cooks. That's the idea that God is, is, is telling us right now about, about his word, about the fact that he is one and everything that flows out of it. The word of God should be upon your heart. So much so every day that your heart's marinating in the word of God. And so the time comes when no matter how you've lived your life, and that's what Jewish people are doing to their children. Listen, listen. Shema. That's what they do to their children. I, I don't know your future. I don't know what path you're going to choose. You may choose not to live for God. You may choose to live for God. But regardless of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to marinate your heart in the word of God. They shall be upon your heart. I'm going to repeat them to you day after day, in the morning, in the evening. I'm going to teach you who God is. I'm going to tell you what he did for us. I'm going to talk about the kingdom of heaven and the, the marvelous experience of being born again. Day after day, morning after morning, night after night. They shall be upon your heart. And then in verse 7, there's that expression, and you shall repeat them. That's a tough word to translate. 
It comes from the word Shanan in Hebrew. And Shanan means to teach the words incisively. To teach by repetition, formally, to repeat, to say it again. To teach certain information or behavior to a student. To review the material two or more times. That's just the dictionary definition here of Shanan. But there's another meaning of Shanan. To sharpen. To sharpen. To sharpen the student. To prepare him to action. This, you shall repeat them. You shall talk of them when you wake up. You shall talk about them as you're having lunch, as you're having dinner, in your, in your prayers before bed. You shall talk to them. You shall repeat them because in doing so, you shall be sharpening your kids to live for God. There's something within them that's never going to die out. They can, they can try walking away from it, but it's going to be so ingrained in them, engraved in their hearts, that sooner or later something is going to be burning them and say, oh, I don't know why, but I, I, when I hear about there's only one God, something within me gets stirred that I want to go back to church and I want to go back to the place where they sang those songs about Jesus and His name and the power Powerful blood that wipes away all our sins. Sharpen your children. Sharpen your children. And we are living in times when the opposite is happening. When we are losing our apostolic identity. When our children, our grandchildren seem to not know. Where we have truly come from. It's almost like the generation that rose after Joseph in Egypt. Joseph saved Egypt from starvation. But there was a generation that came after that. They didn't even know who Joseph was. And that's the generation that enslaved the children of Israel in Egypt. They enslaved their own saviors. Oh, let not that happen to us and our children. Some of our children can't discern between a oneness apostolic church and any other kind of church. Please, please, please. I am not trying to be mean, but I'm telling you, God has given us such a treasure. I am worried about our children that prefer to go to university before they attend the Bible Institute. Uh, it doesn't have to be this Bible Institute, okay? I, I think we have a pretty good teacher sometimes. <laughs> but I remember the time when I was growing up, but we couldn't wait to graduate high school because after high school, guess where we'll go? Bible college, baby. And I understand that our children, I want my children to be one day self-sufficient. I want my daughter to not be uh, dependent on any guy ever. And I want her to, you know, have a career and whatever else. Oh, but I, in my heart, my prayer is when she graduates. Oh, I hope she says, oh, I want to go to a Bible institute, daddy. I want, I, I want to do that first. And then I'm going to go for my degree, whatever it is. But as a church, we are facing a crisis that I think we have bought into the so-called American dream. We're not, and I'm sorry if I use this Bible Institute term, we're not Shemayin enough. If you weren't in the last time, Shemayin, it's an inside word. Shema means to hear to listen, to take heed, to obey. And so sometimes I tease my daughter when I have to repeat something to her more than once or twice or three times. Honey, you're not shemaying. You're not listening. And she knows what it means. She's like, I am too shemaying. And then she goes and does what I wanted her to do in the first place two or three times. 
repetitions ago. But it seems like we are not Shemayin. We even have a t-shirt now. <laughs> so if, if you need your children to Shema a little bit more, maybe you need to get them that t-shirt. And uh, I know our Bible Institute stuff is going to be in the back at the end. So I'm serious, you all. I am serious. They presented me with a t-shirt that actually says, are you Shemayin? And I said, wow, this is fantastic. You know, and I wore that, uh, and I was in an airplane. As I was coming out, the, the, um, the steward was looking at that. I was like, wow, that is very interesting. What does that mean? Oh, come on. Don't ask me what it means. I don't have 20 minutes to explain it right now. <laughs> See, you can be a witness even without trying to be a witness. Just, just wear the right shirt. <laughs> Talk to our people. Please do so. But we, it seems like we're not Shemayan enough. We're, we're not... There's, we have to inculcate in our children. Listen, listen, listen. I know this message is all over the place, right? It's okay. Uh, we are under the mistaken assumption that, the, that our children are Christians. Yeah, you heard me right. It's a mistaken assumption. Because you are not a Christian by birth. Just because... My daughter's father was already a preacher when she was born. And the first words she ever heard were the words of the Shema. Doesn't mean she is a Christian. She still needs to come to the knowledge of the true God. She still needs a conversion of her own. She needs to be born again. How is she ever going to do that? It's not just by me bringing her to church once a week. We have to teach them diligently. We have to teach them diligently. Parents, we have to do that. And so whatever results I want to get, I have to start brainwashing her from today. Are you with me? Right? Every time we go by an accident on the freeway, hmm, they're probably drinking and driving. It has to be drugs, something like that. I mean, and these people, you know, and every, I mean, there's, there's enough accidents until she's 18 years old that she's going to have that ingrained in her, right? Like, uh, you can't drink and drive. You better not do drugs because you're going to end up on the side of the road where your car flipped over. Brainwashing. So we have to do enough of that so that when they grow up and they graduate high school, they're like, I want to go to Bible school. I just want to know more about the Lord. I was looking at the statistics. Mormon, the Mormon church, or also called the Latter-day Saints, they have last year, no, this is in 2020, Two years ago, 2020, they had 51,819 missionaries worldwide. 51,000 missionaries. You know, all apostolic churches, all Pentecostal denominations that preach the same message that we do, if we put all our missionaries together, we don't have half of that. But you know what? Why they get that, that, that amount of missionaries? Because they brainwash them. They know from the moment they are born, they know one day they're going to give each young person, after they graduate high school, they give two full years to missionary work. They save their own money because they have to pay their own way. Both boys and girls. These 51,000 missionaries are young people that just go and arrive to a church and they say, we're going to go, we're going to knock on doors, we're going to give Bible studies. And that's, that's the, the kids you see in their little, little bicycles with their white shirts going around. 51,000. Let me ask you, where are our children? Where? 
We know that in schools they're teaching them critical race theory, trans, trans, they have transgender hour in daycare and libraries, they have the homosexual agenda has won the day. And we think that by bringing my child to Sunday school, they're going to get this by osmosis somehow. No, I have, I have to teach them. I have to tell them about the Lord. This is what somebody said. And I was, I was reading this in the context of the pandemic. Uh, somebody said, if every synagogue were to close around the world, Judaism would survive it would not be destroyed. So, but, but we've seen what happens when every church closes down. We lose half of the membership. And they say, this is what the, the, this rabbi said, the Judaism is our religion of the home, not of the synagogue. They said that we are used. This is what he said. It is expected that every father knows how to teach his faith to his children. And so close our synagogues down and we will still be a nation that believes and loves God. Oh, I wish we could say that. I wish we could say that. Close our churches. We don't care. Because twice a day. In the morning and at night. We are here O Israel. The Lord our God. The Lord is one. And his name is Jesus. We talk about it as we're driving to school. We talk about it when we're having dinner together. We love the Lord and we do not, we, we wish to have a church. We love to congregate, but if we don't have it, we are going to survive and we are going to be ready when the trumpet sounds and the Lord calls us home. They make their homes a sanctuary. After the destruction of the temple, you know that the, the temple was the center of religious life of Judaism. And after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the scattering of the Jewish nation into the exile, the rabbis began to refer to the home as a mikdash me'at. That is a small sanctuary or miniature temple. A Jewish man will not say, my home is my castle. He would say, it's my sanctuary. As a small sanctuary, the home like the temple was to be set aside for special purposes. I don't have time to develop this. But these were the three important purposes of the home. The worship of God. It had to be a house of prayer. The learning of Torah, it was to be a house of study of the Word of God and the serving of community needs. Therefore, it was a house of assembly, a house of prayer, a house of study of the Word, and a house of assembly, a mikdash, be'at. So the dinner table of the home became, as it were, the altar of the temple. Here is the origin of the family altar. Oh, I do hope you have a family altar every night. I hope you pray together and you read a little bit of the word before you put your children to bed. That's why to them eating was more than a physical function. It was a spiritual instrument of religious instruction and service. Because the table was seen as an altar. And it was consecrated to the things of God. This means it wasn't a place where everybody had their iPhone out and, and you know what I mean. So the dinner table was a place where more than food would be passed. It was also a place set apart that the words of the Lord might be exchanged. For one does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. I wondered how the church survived the persecution. After Saul 
started persecuting the church. Stephen was martyred. The Bible says that the church in Jerusalem was scattered throughout. It was great persecution. They, they didn't have time to think or to, 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 to make plans. And no, they just had to grab their family and run away. There were no cell phones. There was no massive text that went to all the church saying we're going to be praying and fasting. And if you are not, if you don't receive the church text, please talk to Sister Jackie and, and, and get on that list. You need those. But they didn't have that. Everybody just took their family and they ran to wherever they thought they could be safe. In Acts 8, 1, it's not going to be in the screen, but it says, At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. How did they survive? Where there was no Facebook to, to tag yourself as safe. Where you couldn't communicate with each other as a community of faith. Where there was no Zoom to pray together or have a Bible study or watch the service online. But Acts 8.4 says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Did you hear that? They were escaping for their lives. They wanted to keep their children safe. But even as they were going... Wherever they were going, they kept preaching the word. Why? Because they were sharpened by the word of God. They realized even in times of persecution, even in times of perilous danger, I still have to share the word of God. Because that was their calling. Shema. Shema is a calling. It's a calling to the fathers and mothers to, to repeat the word, to sharpen our children. Shanan. It's a calling to our children to memorize the word of God, to, to hide it into your heart. It's a calling to every teacher for, of Sunday school or, young, or, or youth, youth minister to train and be trained in the word of God. To preachers, it is to preach the word of God. I am afraid that we think we have learned to preach. And that we don't need any more of the word. You know that this pulpit has the best preaching. Not today, but it usually has the best preaching. And did you know that our esteemed bishop... put together a team some, some years ago. And you know what he, he said? I, I, was, I was invited to, to, to be there and, and I felt this small. After preaching for so many years, after having pastors go and, and, and watch his sermons and then write them down and preach them to their churches, that's what they do. <laughs> you know what he said to that team? He said, I wanna learn to preach better. Pastor Valverde, yes, I want to learn to preach better. I'm afraid of the next generation of people that say, oh, I already know the Word of God. I don't need the Bible Institute. When you don't like this one, go somewhere else, but go. Get more of the Word. And so preachers, preach the Word. Pastors, preach the Word. Preach the Word. How are we going to overcome the times that we're living in? It's going to be through the Shema. Listen, we have such limited time. Listen, lately I've been freaking out inside. Please don't, don't, don't look at me like I have everything together. I don't. And I see time running out. I have to do better at brainwashing my children. They are memorizing scripture. Yes, they are. And... I try to keep up with my daughter's brain. I, I can't any longer. I was like, God, give me more time. Give me more time. Give me more time. There's so much more they need to know. The following conversation took place in the Warsaw Children's Hospital among Jewish children, orphaned from their parents by the Nazis. There's this little kid saying, well, 
When my sister died and mama carried her out, she didn't have any strength left to go and beg. So she just lay there and cried a bit. But I didn't have any strength to go out either. So mama died too. And I wanted to live so terribly much. And I prayed like Papa did before. That is before they killed him. He said, Shema Israel. And I started to say that too. And they came to get the corpses. And they realized that I was alive. And they brought me here and I'm going to live. That was his testimony. He was alive because he started praying like Papa prayed. Why did Papa pray? Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Notice that. By the blood of the Lamb. Yes, yes, yes. But by the word of their testimony. So can we please start repeating the Shema? Everything flows out of it. Day and night, at home and on the road, when you lay down to sleep and when you wake up, Shema, 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 hear, O Israel. By the grace of God, none of, our, none of our children or grandchildren from now on will ever end up in a church that does not preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Why is this so important? Because Adonai Echad, the Lord is one and His name is Jesus. So we are going to be on 21 days of fasting and prayer. And we are being challenged by our, our pastor. Each one win one. But since today is day zero. May I say to you before you go. And preach the gospel to every creature. Please stay and sharpen your children first. Let's pass this on to the next generation. Let's pass this on to our children and grandchildren. Let's keep preaching to our families. This is the way of salvation. It's fine if they're watching some Christian so-called TV or they have a favorite preacher that doesn't preach the whole truth. It's all right. We're not going to dismiss any of that. We're not going to judge anybody because of that. But we can and will and should show them that there is more than that. Yes, it's beautiful that God loves the whole world and has given His child for our salvation. But yeah, but there's more than that. There's also repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all those who are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God should call. Before you go. Stay. And repeat it. Repeat it. And where they're tired and say, Dad, I already know. Mom, come on, I already know that. Repeat it one more time. Don't you ever forget it. I'm going to close with this. We know that during the Second World War, when Hitler was attempting to eradicate the memory of the Jewish people around the world, they killed six million Jews, men, women, and children. But as things were getting from bad to worse, there were some Christians that actually helped save some of those Jewish children. Imagine how heartbreaking it would be for us to give our children to somebody else. Jewish people, Jewish parents giving their children to Christians on the promise that they would take them out of Germany and they would take them and raise them 
somewhere else. Countless children were taken from their parents and they were taken to monasteries and other communities. After the war ended, there was a rabbi who was looking for Jewish children in an attempt to somehow maybe reunite them with their parents if their parents had survived the concentration camps. He went to France where there was a great monastery there and he asked the person in charge if they had any Jewish children that had been saved from the war. The priest that was there said, well, some of their last names sound, sound kind of Jewish, but we can guarantee it. And as far as I know, every child that we have here is a Christian. Unless you have some kind of papers that can prove that one, some of these children belong to the Jewish community, we can't give any of them up. And the rabbi heartbroken, didn't know what to do. Like, and then suddenly he just started singing. Shema Israel Adonai And in the middle of his song, a few children lifted up their hands and joined in. Eloheinu Adonai There was no discussion. The priest knew and the rabbi knew. Those children that were singing the Shema belonged to the Jewish community. I don't know the future. I am deeply, deeply worried about my children in the society that we are living in. wherever they are a few years from now whether they're teenagers or they're married with children of their own if they hear the Shema I want them to know who they belong to and who they really are would you stand with me, please? How will my children survive? There are no guarantees. In the end, it will be up to them. All I can do is do my best teach them the Shema and sharpen them as much as I can. So now we have a homework. We got to learn to sing the Shema. Before you go, stay and sharpen your children. This altar is open right now. This altar is open right now to pray for our children. To pray for those who are far away from God right now. 
that the songs they sang in church come to haunt them at night in their dreams that the echoes of pastor's sermons come to haunt them at night oh call to the east and to the west let go of our children and to the north and to the south give me back my children says the Lord I know some of them are no longer here but by the grace of God they will be back and they will be looking for the same apostolic church they left one day with the same message and the same standards of holiness they will want to come home because there's something in their hearts that says Shema Shema Church would you join me in crying out for our children right now however old they are and wherever they may be let's cry out to God for them right now